Thank you everyone for joining this talks at Google uh, work from home style. My name is Cassandra Moultrie and I'll be uh, opening today for Kevin. Uh, so June is LGBTQ plus pride month, a time meant to commemorate the Stonewall protest of 1969. For some, it's a joyful time, time to celebrate the rights we've won, struggles we've overcome and the love of our chosen and created families. Um, for LGBTQ plus black, Plus people, we have played a profound role in the fight for the rights we currently enjoy, such as Marsha P. Johnson, Andre Lord, and Bayard Rustin. The connection between our community is something we want to honor. In recent weeks, the murders of Ahmaud Arbery, Sean Reed, Breonna Taylor, Tony McCade, McDade, George Floyd, and others have been top of mind for many of us. The Black community is hurting, and we as a community steeped in fighting for justice must stand in solidarity. Uh, these occurrences highlight the need for each of us to support uh, others, even when we are unsure what to say or do, to educate ourselves about our community and those communities we do not know as much about and to call out injustice each time it occurs. Um, today, we're taking a moment to learn a bit about the history of the LGBTQ movements um, seeping back well into the 1600s. And with that being said, I'm gonna give you a brief intro about Kevin. So Kevin Jennings is a longtime leader in the fight for LGBTQ plus equality. He became a high school history teacher after becoming the first member of his family to earn a college degree in 1985 after he graduated from Harvard. And he helped students create the nation's first gay straight alliance club. So GSA, as many people know it today, in 1988, while teacher in Concord, Massachusetts. He went out to found GLSEN, uh, the Gay, Lesbian, and Straight Education Network in 1990, the first national organization dedicated to fighting anti-LGBTQ plus bias in K through 12 schools. In 1994, Kevin was part of the committee which created LGBTQ History Month, now observed every October, and he authored Becoming Visible, the first textbook on the subject for young people. In 1996, he helped write and produce, out of the past, the first documentary on LGBTQ history for young people, which won the Assistant Secretary of Education for Safe and Drug-Free Schools uh, Award. Um, in 2009, he became the Assistant Secretary of Education uh, for safe and drug-free schools, where he led the Obama administration's national campaign against bullying in schools, earning him the nickname of being the anti-bullying czar. Kevin went on from the Obama administration to run the Arcus Foundation, the world's largest private funder of LGBTQ rights, and the Tenement Museum, the nation's premier museum dedicated to the immigrant experience. Most recently, he has served as the executive producer of the 2019 PBS documentary, The Lavender Scare, which details the McCarthy era witch hunts for LGBTQ people and the 2020 documentary, Welcome to Chechnya, which covers the ongoing program against LGBTQ people in the Russian Republic of Chechnya, and which will air on HBO on June 30th at 10 p.m. Eastern time. In December, 2019, Kevin became the CEO of Lambda Legal, the nation's oldest legal advocacy group fighting for full legal equality for LGBTQ people and everyone living with HIV. Kevin also holds an MBA from Columbia University and an MBA from New York University and has authored seven books. With uh, that being said, here's Kevin. Thank you, Cassandra. Um, I'd like to begin by echoing what you had to say about the fact that this is a Pride Month unlike any other, and one in which many of us don't feel much like celebrating given what has happened to our black brothers and sisters in this country. Um, and I'd like to begin with a moment of silence in the memory of George Floyd, Tony McDade, the black trans man who was shot to death in Tallahassee two days after George Floyd was murdered by the police in Minneapolis and the many other black people who we have lost due to police violence, vigilante violence and other forms of violence in America. Thank you. I wanted to focus on LGBTQ history today because if people know anything about LGBTQ history, and usually they don't know much, they think that the LGBTQ history started at the Stonewall Inn in 1969. 
And that is simply not true. And I wanted uh, those people who were able to join us today to know the depth and richness of the heritage of the LGBT community. And I'd like to begin by pointing something very basic out to folks, which is that LGBTQ people are not the newcomer to the North American continent. Bigotry against us is. And that's because we know that among Native American people in many tribes, there was a tradition now known as two-spirit people. And two-spirit people were people who we would call today, using modern terminology, transgender. There were people who were seen as having had a special vision in which they played the role of a sex not like the biological one into which they were born. And these people were far from scorned, esteemed and respected by their tribes for having been given a special vision unlike that given to ordinary people. In fact, this is one of the most famous two-spirit people that we know of that has come down to us through history, an individual known as Waywa. Waywa was a member of the Zuni tribe of what is now New Mexico in the 19th century. When the Zuni tribe had to renegotiate its relationship with the U.S. government in the late 1800s, they had to choose the most respected leaders of their tribe to go to Washington to do so. And Waywa was one of the leaders of their tribe that they chose to journey to Washington in the 1880s to negotiate with the U.S. government. Now, I find this a fascinating cross-cultural moment. White people scorned people who we would now consider transgender. Native people so esteemed them that they would choose them as their official representatives to negotiate with the U.S. government. So before the coming of white people, people who we today, today consider to be LGBTQ were esteemed and valued on the North American continent. This changed due to the different value system brought by white people to North America, first with the Spanish arriving in Florida in the 1500s, and then with the English arriving in what became New England and Virginia in the early 1600s. In 1642, in the colony of Massachusetts, we had our first capital laws passed. Capital laws are laws for which one can be executed if one commits a particular crime. Of the 15 capital crimes in the state of Massachusetts in 1642, nine of them deal with sex. Law seven, law eight, sorry, is the one most appropriate to us. If a man lieth with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed abomination. They both shall surely be put to death. This is the great grandfather of what would become known in American history as sodomy laws. These were laws that punished people for engaging in same-sex sexual relations. They would be adopted in all 13 colonies. And when the colonies became independent in the War of Independence, the revolution as we know it, in the 1770s, many colonies, when they became states, had to update their laws. Thomas Jefferson was put in charge of updating the laws of what would become the state of Virginia. He recommended downgrading sodomy from being a capital crime to one being punished only by castration. This was considered too liberal by the state of Virginia at the time, and they refused to lessen the punishment for sodomy, keeping it a capital crime in the 1770s. Believe it or not, some version of the sodomy law would remain on the books in many states until the 21st century. We will come back to this later in the presentation. Despite the laws and the persecution that LGBTQ people faced, they nevertheless found a way to survive and to form communities. This is a map from the 1930s and 40s of social spaces created by African-American lesbians in New York City. And you can see 25 specific institutions, restaurants, bars, parks, other places where African-American lesbians were known to congregate and to find community with one another. Even in a time when being LGBTQ was against the law, when it was deemed a mental illness for which one could be institutionalized, LGBTQ people found a way to survive, to find one another, and to form community. And beginning 100 years ago, they began to organize and fight for their rights. 
The first person to do so was this man, Henry Gerber. Henry Gerber was a German immigrant, and he was sent as part of the American occupying army to Germany after World War I. In Germany, he learned of the work of Magnus Hirschfeld, who was a pioneering gay rights activist in Germany, where he was working to repeal sodomy laws in that country. His scientific humanitarian committee got 120,000 people to join, including such no notable Germans as Albert Einstein. Gerber learned about this, came back to Chicago where he lived and said, if they could do it in Germany, we could do it in America. And he formed America's first LGBT rights group, the Society for Human Rights on December 10th, 1924. You may be wondering why have I never heard of the Society for Human Rights? That's because the first act of the society was to publish a magazine because they felt it was important to educate people about the reality of LGBTQ lives. The problem was in the 1920s, any literature about homosexuality was considered pornography. Even if it had no erotic content and no illustrations, it was pornography, and it was illegal to mail pornography through the U.S. mail. Someone tipped off the postal authorities, and they seized all copies of this magazine called Friendship and Freedom, and they tracked down the Society for Human Rights Incorporation papers, which you see on the screen, and they arrested all of the people who were involved in incorporating the society. These people were released from jail shortly afterwards, but were so terrified and traumatized that they never tried to convene again. Gerber worked at, you guessed it, the U.S. Post Office, which immediately fired him for his activism. Gerber would move to New York to try to start a new life and would never try to organize again. But when people tell you that the first time LGBTQ people fought for their rights was at Stonewall in 1969, Remind them that the first time people tried to organize for our rights was 45 years before in Chicago. What really changed the game for LGBTQ people in America, though, was World War II. Before World War II, America had no standing military, and 60% of Americans lived in small towns of 10,000 or fewer people. If you were LGBTQ, you probably felt pretty alone. But with the mobilization of millions of people into sex-segregated, and I might point out also race-segregated units in World War II, people began to find each other and form community on a level never seen before. Humans of New York is one of my favorite websites. They simply go up to people in New York and interview them. I think the interviewer probably got a little surprised when they went up to this little old man in a park in New York and asked him to tell them their story. His answer was, I had a ton of fun during the Korean War. There were 10 to 15 gay soldiers on the base. As long as we weren't seen doing anything, they couldn't discharge us. So we all rented a hotel room once a month, plastered the wall with playbills from a streetcar named Desire, and had lots of sex. This was a common story for LGBTQ people in the military in the 40s and 50s where they found each other and formed communities and made connections. And they came back from the war, they landed in ports like San Francisco and Los Angeles and New York and Seattle. They thought about going back to those small towns and they decided instead to stay in those big cities. And the modern gay communities that we are, many of us are a part of, were born. My favorite single story from this era is the story told by this woman Sergeant Johnny Phelps, which you can go on YouTube and find. Johnny Phelps was in the WAC Battalion, which served General Dwight Eisenhower, the commander of Allied Forces in Europe. He called her in one day and said, Sergeant Phelps, I understand that there are a lot of lesbians in your battalion. I would like a list of these women so they can be expelled. Sergeant Phelps said, well, General Eisenhower, uh, you are my commanding officer and I will provide you with such a list if you insist. But before I do so, I wanna say two things. First of all, our battalion is one of the most highly decorated battalions in the Women's Auxiliary Corps. We perform our duties uh, with great success. You have given us numerous commendations. I see no reason why these women should be dismissed based on their performance. It's irrelevant that they're lesbians. Number two, um, if you do insist on having such a list, I will provide it to you. 
so long as you understand that my name will be first on the list. President Eisenhower, or later President Eisenhower, then General Eisenhower, looked at Sergeant Phelps and said, why don't we forget that order? When he became president, though, General Eisenhower would give in to political pressure and in 1953 signed Executive Order 104500. This banned the employment of known perverts in the federal government. LGBTQ people were deemed to be security threats and their employment was banned by the government by this executive order, leading to the so-called Lavender Scare. Many people know about the Red Scare, which led to witch hunts for communists. Fewer people know about the Lavender Scare, which led to witch hunts for LGBTQ people. More LGBTQ people were expelled from the government than communists. And elements of this uh, executive order would remain on the books until repealed by President Clinton in the 1990s. For almost 40 years, it was difficult for LGBTQ people to hold a government job in America. Even in the face of being deemed criminals, being unable to get jobs, and being called mentally ill, LGBTQ people fought back, like these two women, Del, L Del Martin and Phyllis Lyon. They lived in San Francisco, and in 1955, they formed America's first lesbian rights organization, the Daughter of, Daughters of Belitis. It is important for you to recognize not just how scary it was for LGBTQ people in 1955, but how scary it was for women. A single woman could not get a credit card in 1955 unless their father signed their application. Think about that. Yet these two women formed a partnership and as partners formed an organization to fight for the rights of lesbians. They'll come back later in the slideshow. Similarly, trans people began to speak out and become visible. This is Christine Jorgensen. Christine Jorgensen was the first known person to undergo um, a surgery to make her gender conform to her felt gender. And that was a media sensation in 1955 when it took place. Christine was willing to be public about her experience and that made her front page news in America. And her visibility was a critical moment for trans people who for the first time had somebody who was willing to be completely public about who they were and to be willing to be in the media 60 years before Caitlyn Jenner. This is Jose Saria. Jose Saria was a drag performer who owned a, ba a bar in San Francisco, which the police continually raided and harassed people in the 50s and early 60s. And Jose Saria finally decided in the early 60s that they had had enough. And in 1961, Jose Saria became the first out person to ever run for political office in American history when they ran for the San Francisco Board of Supervisors. Everyone's heard of Harvey Milk. Jose Saria ran for supervisor 17 years before Harvey Milk. Jose Saria also founded the imperial court system. The imperial court system exists to this day. It is a competition system which raises money for LGBTQ charities and literally has raised tens of millions of dollars over the last six, 60 years to benefit LGBTQ charities. Unfortunately, Jose did not win, but the important thing is that Jose ran in the first place. Also in the 1960s, Bayard Rustin rose to prominence. Bayard Rustin was a longtime activist. In the 1940s, he organized the first freedom rides in American history when people of both black and white heritage joined hands and integrated buses in the South. He would be arrested and imprisoned in my hometown Winston-Salem, North Carolina, for doing so in 1944. He was an apostle of nonviolent civil disobedience, having been raised a Quaker, and he was brought in to teach Martin Luther King some of the basic principles 
of nonviolent civil disobedience and became something of a mentor to King. He did all of this while being unapologetically openly gay in the 1940s and 50s. He paid a price for that and was purged from the civil rights movement. But in 1963, when Martin Luther King called a march on Washington with only six weeks notice, he informed the rest of the movement leaders, you know there's only one man who knows how to pull this off and we're bringing him in to organize the march. That man was Bayard Rustin. And on the day of that march, the first person to speak at the Lincoln Memorial was Bayard Rustin. We all remember the last person to speak who gave that beautiful I Have a Dream speech, Martin Luther King. But we also need to remember the first person to speak, an openly gay man who organized the march itself, Bayard Rustin. LGBTQ people watched what Bayard Rustin did and they learned and they realized that they could copy the techniques that he was using. One of them was the second man in this line, Frank Kameny. Frank Kameny was a Harvard-trained astrophysicist. He applied for a job in the federal government and was rejected because he was gay. He decided he wasn't going to take this laying down. He took his case all the way to the Supreme Court, which refused to hear it. And having exhausted that angle, he decided to organize what would be the first picketing of the White House in 1965 for gay rights. And here he is with his uh, compatriots right outside the White House. Now, you may be curious why they're all dressed like this. Um, Frank had a slogan, if you want to be employed, you need to look employable. So he made everybody dress like they were going to a job interview. And they got out there in 1965, a year in which it was still a criminal act to engage in same-sex sexual relationships, when it was still a mental illness that could get you institutionalized, and they picketed the White House. His friend Barbara Giddings from Philadelphia, shown first marching in line in this protest, decided she could do the same thing in her city. So every July 4th, beginning in 1966, she organized the annual reminder, a picket march in front of Independence Hall on July 4th, the most visible day of the year, reminding people that not all Americans have their civil rights, especially LGBTQ people. And in 1969, an event happened, which you all know about, which changed everything. New York Times didn't pay much attention. They gave it a small article on page B29 of the Metro section. What happened that night was the police did what they had been doing for years. They came into a gay bar and they began to rough up the patrons. And this wasn't the first time they'd done that. And it wasn't the first time patrons had fought back. They had fought back at Cooper's Donuts in Los Angeles in 1959, at Compton Cafeteria in San Francisco in 1966, at the Black Cat Tavern in Los Angeles in 1967. But this was the biggest. And for three nights, there was unrest in the Greenwich Village in New York City. And the entire LGBT community nationwide was electrified. And people began to realize that they didn't have to take it anymore. And central figures like this, Sylvia Rivera on the left, Marsha P. Johnson on the right, early trans leaders who were central to this movement, taught our community that they could come out and be liberated. An entirely new attitude. Don't dress like you want to fit in. Be who you want to be. And with that new attitude, an entirely new movement emerged in the 1970s and forced the American Psychological Association in 1973 to remove homosexuality from its list of mental illnesses and began to get the sodomy laws repealed in many states. And the movement began to progress rapidly in the 1970s and gay liberation began to take hold. And then in 1981, a strange cancer began to appear among gay men. And at first it was nicknamed gay cancer because normally this strange cancer, Kaposi's sarcoma, only struck Mediterranean men in their 70s and 80s. 
And for some reason, it was striking gay men in their 20s and 30s and killing them. And then doctors began to realize it wasn't just this cancer. It was something that was attacking their immune systems because they were getting other odd diseases and dying. So they called it gay-related immune deficiency syndrome, GRID. And then they began to realize that other people were getting sick and dying too. So they called it acquired immune deficiency syndrome or AIDS. A word our president at the time, Ronald Reagan, would not say for six years in public by which time over 50,000 Americans, the overwhelming majority of them gay men, had died. This was the first article about what would become known as AIDS. As the LGBT community often does, it organized and fought back in the face of a society that did not care. One of the people who led that fight was the man who died just two weeks ago Larry Kramer. Larry Kramer organized a group called the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, ACT UP, and they adopted the, the slogan, silence equals death. And they took the symbol that gay men were forced to wear in Nazi concentration camps, the pink triangle, and they turned it upside down, symbolizing that this time gay people would not die quietly. And they took to the streets. They did things like blocking the Brooklyn Bridge at rush hour, which I was proud to be part of myself, uh, seizing control of the National Institute of Health headquarters in Washington, and other actions that forced the government to finally pay attention and do something about HIV and AIDS. As a result, by the 90s, mid 90s, treatments became available and AIDS went from being a death sentence to being a treatable disease. We're still waiting for a cure. In 1988, I was a high school teacher in Concord, Massachusetts, as was referenced before. I had lost my first job because I was gay. And for my second job, I was understandably very nervous about whether or not I should be out of the closet because you have to remember what the 80s were like. There was no law protecting people from being fired based on being gay in any state except Wisconsin. The AIDS epidemic was at its height. Ronald Reagan was president. It was a very different time. But I always tell LGBTQ teachers, it's a glass closet. The kids always know who you are. And sure enough, a gay student came to me and told me he was thinking of killing himself. I told him that we needed to go get him help. And he said to me, why shouldn't I kill myself? My life isn't worth saving anyway. That took me back. I was 24 at the time to how I had felt when I was 16 growing up in North Carolina when I had tried to kill myself. And I made myself a promise that day that whatever I did with the rest of my life, I would do whatever I could to make sure the next generation of LGBTQ people did not grow up feeling like that. So a couple of weeks later, we had an assembly at the school and I got up and I came out to the entire school. The next day, a young woman came into my office. I was surprised she wasn't my student. She wasn't on any of the teams I coached. I mainly knew her as the hot freshman girl with the hot senior boyfriend who was always making out outside my classroom, which kind of annoyed me. And so I said, can I help you? And she said, yeah, I want to start a club to fight homophobia. And I said, okay, um, why do you care so much about this? And she said, that's easy. My mother's a lesbian and I'm tired of hearing my family get put down around this school. Naive little me had never thought about the fact that I might have a kid who had an LGBTQ parent. So I said, oh, okay, um, wh what are we going to call this club? She said, I don't know. You're gay and I'm straight. Let's call it the Gay Straight Alliance. And that day, November 11th, 1988, the first GSA in American history was formed. And here I am. I'm the guy in the glisten, purple glisten t-shirt, third from the left with students from that GSA at the March on Washington 
for LGBTQ rights in 1993. Ten years later, in 2003, these two men, Tyrone Garner on the right and John Lawrence on the left, they were residents of Houston, Texas. The police entered their apartment on another charge, but found them having sex. And that was still illegal in Texas and 14 other states, thanks to those old sodomy laws from 400 years before. John and Tyrone decided to fight back. So with the help of Lambda Legal, the organization I now run, they sued and they took their case to the Supreme Court. And in 2003, they won. And finally, after 400 years, sodomy laws were struck down in America. That same year, these two women, Hillary and Julie Goodrich, in the state of Massachusetts, sued the state, saying that it was illegal to discriminate against them based on their gender and denied them the right to marry simply because they were two women. And in November 2003, the state of Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court agreed. And Massachusetts became the first state in America to grant two people of the same sex the equal right to marry. Remember the two women who started Daughters of Belitis back in 1955? Del Martin and Phyllis Lyon? Well, in 2008, the state of California followed Massachusetts' lead and legalized same-sex marriage. Gavin Newsom, then the mayor of San Francisco, now the governor of California, contacted all the other municipalities in California and said on the day that same-sex marriage became legal, you're all going to wait. Phyllis and Dell are going to be the first people married in the state of California. They have earned this after 53 years of fighting. And they were. Here they are, being married by Mayor Newsom. Dell would die a few months later. Phyllis died in April. In 2015, this man, Jim Obergefell, in a case in which Lambda Legal was the co-counsel, would win in the Supreme Court the right for all people to have the right to marry, culminating the battle that had been launched so many years before. Remember Frank Kameny, the guy who picketed the White House in 1965? This is him inside the White House during the Obama years, when President Obama signed a new law granting same-sex partners the same benefits as opposite-sex partners in federal employment. He had Frank come to the signing so that Frank could witness this moment, a government that once wouldn't give him a job because he was gay, now giving same-sex couples the same benefits as opposite-sex couples. Frank was asked by the Smithsonian, do you have any of the signs you carried back in the 60s? If you knew Frank, which I did, Frank saved everything. Frank said, of course I have those signs. So he donated one to the Smithsonian. And here he is at the Smithsonian with one of his signs. And if today, if you go to the American Muse Museum of American History at the Smithsonian, you will find this sign on display. I bought Frank, brought Frank to speak at the U.S. Department of Education in 2011, shortly before he died on October 11th, 2011. Poetically, Frank Kameny died on National Coming Out Day. People continue to make history. People like the woman on the left, Andrea Jenkins, who became the first out trans person of color elected to public office in America when she won a Minneapolis city council seat in 2018. And the woman on the right, Danica Rome, who became the first out trans person elected to state government when she won a, a position in the Virginia State House of Burgesses in 2018 as well. But I don't want to leave you with the sense that the fight is over. If you live in a blue state today, you if you get fired based on your sexual orientation, you have legal protection. If you live in one of the beige states, 
you don't. In 28 states, you could still be fired from your job because you are gay and you have no legal protections against this. If you live in one of the red countries, it is still illegal for you to have sex with someone of the same sex. In eight of these countries, it is a capital crime. You can still be put to death. Right now at Lambda Legal, we are waiting for a decision from the Supreme Court on a case under Title VII, in which it has been argued that you cannot fire people from their jobs based on their sexual orientation or their gender identity. The plaintiff in the gender identity case is this woman, Amy Stevens. Amy worked at a funeral home in Michigan, and when she informed her boss that she planned to come out as trans, her boss fired her. The woman on the left is Lambda Legal's legal director, Sharon McGowan. They're outside the Supreme Court on the day Amy's case was heard, October 8th, 2019. Amy died last month. She didn't live long enough to see whether or not justice will be served. It's up to us to carry on the fight for Amy and for Phyllis and Dell and for Frank and for Marcia and Sylvia and for all the people who came before us and fought so that we could be free. Some of those people we'll never know. The first permanent magazine for LGBTQ rights was called One. And people would write letters to it. They could only sign where they were from because it wasn't safe to use your real name. In October 1954, someone wrote this letter. I will always remain willing to support in my small way any effort to reduce intolerance towards a minority group in the United States. Intolerance is basically as un-American as communism. It's the McCarthy era. I realize the road ahead of us is long and difficult, but that part of the road already traveled has been pretty tough too. And the letters from Winston-Salem, North Carolina, my hometown, 10 years before I was born. Someone was fighting for me. Someone I never knew and will never know. We have the degree of freedom we have today because a previous generation in far scarier times under far worse conditions took unbelievable risks and fought for us to be freer than they were. And we now owe it to the next generation to fight for them to be freer than we are. It is wrong that trans people of color are dying on our streets. It is wrong that 40% of homeless youth are LGBTQ. It is wrong that in 70 countries you can still be imprisoned because you are gay, lesbian, or bisexual. These things must change. It is up to us to change them. We owe prior generations a debt. And changing those things is the way we repay it. Thank you for listening. Great. So thank you so much for that, Kevin. Uh, we've had a few questions that have come up in the chat. Uh, that we wanted to ask. So what are your thoughts on fighting to incorporate LGBTQ plus history into American or even for that matter, uh, global history books? Absolutely. It's long overdue. Um, you know, the black nationalist Marcus Garvey once said, a people without history is like a tree without roots. And I think it's absolutely critical for young LGBTQ people to um, 
know their history as part of developing a sense of self and a sense of self-esteem, it's equally critical for young non-LGBTQ people to understand the experience of LGBTQ people because it's part of their learning to understand and respect us. Great, thank you so much for that. Uh, we have one more question. Uh, do you have any favorite book recommendations relating to LGBTQ plus history? Oh, there's so many great books. I'm gonna recommend two. Uh, one is The Gay Revolution by Lillian Faderman. Um, I'll write these in the chat box. Um, Lillian is, um, she really was one of the early historians to um, explore LGBTQ history. She, back like 34 years ago, she started the research and helped create the field. Uh, and then there's a wonderful book by Susan Stryker, who did the same thing with transgender history called Transgen Just Transgender History by Susan Stryker. Um, I put that in there as well. Um, there are a million books I could recommend, but if you only had time to read two, read those two. Uh, and I actually have a question <laughs> to yeah, ask. For it. So in light of the current protest taking place in America in response to police brutality against the black community, what parallels uh, can you draw to the Stonewall protests of 1969? I know you touched on it a bit, me at the beginning, but you know, hoping to get your perspective here. The LGBTQ people of today should all be out in the street right now. Wearing your mask is staying six feet away from other people, but should all be out in the street for two reasons. First of all, we have historically been the victims of police brutality and police harassment. Um, going back, as I pointed out, not just to Stonewall, to before Stonewall. Um, and we, we are, pride is a celebration of a riot against police brutality. So what are we waiting for? Get out there. You know, this is our heritage. We have been victims of police brutality and police harassment forever, and we should be standing against police brutality and police harassment whenever it happens and whoever the victims are. And secondly, the most consistent block voting for LGBTQ rights in Congress is the Congressional Black Caucus, which has a 100% voting record on our issues. And there's an old saying, if you wanna have an ally, you gotta be an ally. If the LGBTQ movement is going to ask the African-American Civil Rights Movement to be there for us, then we absolutely have to stand with them. And we have to recognize that it's not really an us them thing because there are LGBTQ people who are African American. So if we're gonna liberate our community, we have to also address racism because there's no such thing as LGBTQ liberation that does not address racism because if we don't eliminate racism, we have not liberated all LGBTQ people. So that would be what I have to say on that subject. So to recap, number one, we are a community that understands police harassment and police brutality. We must stand with those fighting it. And number two, we must stand with the black community because first of all, part of our community is part of the black community. And secondly, the black community has historically been our strongest political allies in Congress. And if we are going to ask them to be our ally, we have to be their ally. Great, thank you so much. I felt the passion there. Um, we do have one additional question that came in. Can you talk a bit about uh, the Moxes and the Azaka, um, which came in from Sunil? Um, you have stumped me. So um, I no, I can't. Completely understand. There's so much going on right now. Uh, and I just want to recognize everyone who's talking actively in the chat. Um, 
everyone's super appreciative of the lessons that they're learning here. Um, the history, I know for me personally, I learned a lot about the history of a community I identify with that I really had no idea about. Um, so I much appreciate that. Um, before we wrap up here, I did want to ask, is there any particular virtual event or maybe even a socially distance event that you're looking forward to that um, is, you know, pivoted towards the LGBTQ plus community that you'd encourage anyone to virtually engage in or, again, socially distance uh, attend over the next few months? Oh, gosh, there's so many. Um, I tell you one of the things that I'm really excited and proud about. Um, L.A. Pride has been turned into a march for Black Lives. And I think that's fantastic. Um, and so if you're in L.A., go be part of that. Um, and I would urge you, so many things are happening on the local level. I can't keep track of them all. But I thought that was a really powerful and wonderful statement by the organizers of L.A. Pride um, and I hope that more people in the community will follow their lead. Great. Well, again, Kevin, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, the history has been amazing to listen to and just kind of watch through all the images you provided. Um, any last words before we wrap up? Um, you know, as I was mentioned in the intro, I worked for President Obama. And President Obama used to always say, um, we are the ones we have been waiting for. So don't wait around for leaders. Be the leader. Great. Well, thank you so much, Kevin. And uh, thank you to everyone who joined. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, everyone.